welcome to Updates, your monthly Medfield updates. I'm Audrey Ensor, and this is our February 2021 episode. We're covering Medfield annual town election information, Medfield Together's Black History Month knowledge quest, updates from Medfield Outreach, the Select Board, the School Committee, and Medfield TV. First up, let's talk about the annual town election that will be held on Monday, March 29th, 2021. Polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the center. Positions that will appear on the ballot include select board, moderator, town clerk, assessor, school committee, library trustee, planning board, park commissioner, housing authority, and trust fund commissioner. In March, Medfield TV will be releasing an episode of our show, What's on the Ballot, that will feature short statements from each candidate. We will also be releasing episodes of our show, Meet the Candidates, that will feature longer interviews with specifically the school committee candidates, since this is the only contended race. February is Black History Month, so Medfield Together created a Black History Knowledge Quest around town in celebration. What the Adults, a Medfield TV original show, joined the quest. Welcome to a fun vlog edition of What the Adults. <laughs> Today we're doing Medfield Together's Black History Month Knowledge Quest. Medfield Together this month for Black History Month has put together a knowledge quest around town. So there are a bunch of different locations around town that have information about different people in black history that are important and have done great things. So we have Zora Neale Hurston. Oh, Lonnie Johnson's the man. Lonnie is best known for inventing the Super Soaker. Oh, whoa! Ranked amongst the world's top 20 best-selling toys for many years and is still sold in toys oh. in stores today. Yeah, Lonnie Johnson's the man. Thank wow. you, Lonnie. Madam C.J. Walker. So we got Faith Ringgold and Bessie Coleman. So we have Kamala Harris. Welcome to Juice on Main. <laughs> Here we have Alice H. Parker. Thanks to Medfield Together for putting on this latest initiative. Visit their website, medfieldtogether.com, for more information on this inclusive and anti-oppressive organization. The full episode of What the Adults Participating in the Black History Knowledge Quest will be available on our watch page, medfield.tv slash watch, or on our YouTube channel, Medfield TV. You can also listen to this and other interviews and meetings on the Medfield TV podcast at medfield.tv slash listen or on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And now we have a Medfield TV update with Executive Director Brett Poirier. Boy, did we have a busy month. We are so proud to bring to you two fantastic movies produced by the Medfield High School Theater Society, Mary Rose, the story of a girl who disappears mysteriously twice, and Telltale Heart from Edgar Allan Poe, a tragic tale of murder and mystery. These two productions had so many amazing accomplishments to talk about. Theater Society director Andrea McCoy spent countless hours planning, directing, editing, and producing this production, learning an entirely different skill set so her kids could continue their passions for acting and tech-driven goals behind the scenes. Midfield TV was so proud to help produce these productions. And although every student deserves a shout out for their parts in this, Nicole Mulready was able to direct for the first time in the production of Telltale Heart. Not only did she get to direct, but she also edited her own movie and did it following COVID protocols. These two movies were tremendous feats that we at Midfield TV are so proud of the Theater Society for pulling off. You can watch both movies on our watch page, YouTube channel, or education channel, Comcast 12, and Verizon 36. We have a new fantastic program supporting Medfield Together called Yoga for a Cause. We are so happy to bring a new episode for the first Wednesday of every month on our public channel and watch page at 5 a.m. for those early birds and 7 p.m. for people like me. Each session is led by Adrian Mandingo, and they ask that you make a $5 donation to Medfield Together through Adrian Mandingo's Venmo account. These sessions are geared for anyone they are kid friendly, or they're just great to take a breath, relax with a good yoga. Live streaming will continue for selectmen, church services, and sports as well. We have been introducing some other boards and committees as needed, but I wanna say this about the live streaming on sports coverage. 
It's been a huge task under the current pandemic and being a former athlete, a current coach, and with parents who are in the stands every week for my own performances, I really relate to the situation and importance for parents to watch their kids play. I personally have been filming the boys' hockey games, John Smith Jr. has been covering the girls' hockey games, and athletic director Eric Scott has been using the new huddle cams to cover basketball. I know we did as much as we could given what we had to deal with, the changing schedules, the limited streaming abilities, but I also know it wasn't enough. I know what it means for parents to watch their kids compete, and Medfield TV was happy to supply something for you to do so. But I really feel for parents who couldn't be in the stands watching every steal, every point, or every goal this season. I hope we get back to normal soon. But until then, Medfield TV will do its best to continue to live stream home games for our audience. Speaking of live streaming, we have a huge anniversary coming up. The one year celebration of the Mike Page Doodle Club. It's March 18th at 3.30 p.m. We'll be doing a live celebration, including a plethora of news and changes for the show. A live doodle with Mike and some friends, and an interview of how this whole thing came about. The Mike Page Doodle Club has been syndicated across the country over 1,300 times and continues to be a huge success. We want to thank Mike and everyone who's been watching over the past year. That will be March 18th. 3.30 p.m. on our public channel and watch page. The last thing I want to mention before Audrey yanks me out of the chair is that Medfield TV's YouTube channel is encroaching on our goal of over 1,000 subscribers. We hit 900 and are hoping that you will help us get over that goal. It helps us a lot if you subscribe and keeps you updated with all that Medfield TV is producing. If you want to get involved, email info at medfield.tv. I'm Brett Poirier, and that was your Medfield TV update. Next is an update from Medfield Outreach. So Medfield Outreach is a town department, and we predominantly provide a whole host of social services to the Medfield community. We're really good at hooking people up with resources, finding an answer to, to many issues and many problems to, a, to the best of our ability, not every, but, but many. And so I just encourage folks, really reach out, no question or no need is, is foolish or don't be afraid. We are here that this is what this department is. It's for support, it's for help, it's for clinical issues, it's for needs-based issues, it's for prevention issues. Those services sort of fall into three main categories. One being needs-based referrals, which is needs-based work, which means we help people with assistance to access financial programming. The other thing we do is we provide a whole host of clinical services to, to people within the community, and I can talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. And then the third piece of what we do is what we call our prevention work. And the prevention work really com is comprised of two major coalitions that we are on, the Midfield Outreach is on the steering committee and provides administration. Both of those coalitions are initiatives of the Medfield Foundation. So we work closely with the Medfield Foundation and they are called Medfield Coalition for Suicide Prevention, which many people will see MCSP. And then the other coalition is the Medfield Cares About Prevention Coalition. Medfield Cares About Prevention, also known as MCAP, is a community-based coalition in Medfield. Now we are able to function in the way that we do because we've recently received a drug-free communities grant from the federal government was awarded to the town of Medfield. Yahoo! And so what that has allowed for is access to resources. So that, that means that I was able to be hired. That means we have resources for programming and skill building and training and all sorts of different things. Throughout this whole pandemic, we have been still making moves uh, virtually, but nonetheless making moves. Some of our recent achievements have been, uh, we completed a Medfield student survey in the high school and also in the middle school. So we got some data from, from the students about their mental health status at this point, substance use, and we're currently in the process of crunching those numbers. So more to come on that. Uh, we also completed a social host campaign. I don't know if you all saw it around town, parents who host lose the most. And that was really to inform folks about the laws around hosting uh, with young people and, and alcohol and, and all of that. So you can find more about that on our website at medfieldcares.org. Um, so that was one of our recent achievements. Another thing we did is actually just a few weeks ago, we had 10 high school youth show up and come to our 
CADCA Forum, and CADCA stands for Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. It was a national leadership forum where youth and substance prevention specialists from across the country came together. Our youth got a real taste of what prevention looks like. They, they learned some skills, and we're really uh, impressed with the way that everybody showed up for that, and we're excited to see what comes next um, with our youth work. So if you are interested in getting involved in any way, learning more information, you have a question about substance use or about you know its effect on the adolescent brain, something to that effect, please reach out. The best way to contact me is via email, and that is mhaas, H-A-A-S, at medfield.net. Another really good way is through social media. Um, our, our handle is Medfield Cares, and you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're kind of all over the place, and we're looking for input. We're looking for um, really just increasing the community involvement with our coalition, so we invite every and anyone who's, who's interested. So Medfield Outreach does provide free and confidential counseling services. And so we have two clinicians, two full-time clinicians, myself and Chelsea Goldstein-Walsh, and we are both licensed independent clinical social workers. In addition to the two of us, we also have graduate intern, a clinical intern who carries a small caseload herself. So we, we do provide and are able to provide individual family counseling as people need it. In addition to that, what we've found is that during the pandemic, the clinical need is such that people are having a really difficult time getting in with a therapist. So we, we developed drop-in hours. You could either call, which that phone number is 508-359-7121, or you could email medfieldoutreach at medfield.net and say, I'd like to make an appointment for your drop-in hours. The drop-in hours, we're giving guidelines to drop-in hours, but we'll really work with anybody around their availability. So right now, the drop-in hours that we have specifically for students is Tuesday, Thursdays, 2 to 3.30. Again, if there is a conflict, if there is some extracurricular activity or sports that conflicted with that time, we will certainly make something else work. And then our parent times that we have, well, not parent, I shouldn't say all adult, is um, Tuesday, Thursday, 10 to 11.30. And again, the same rule applies. Our goal is to help people feel like they're not alone and they're not struggling and they're not suffering out there. And, um, and that's been the purpose of these drop-in hours. And I think that they've been um, well-received and we'll keep them for as long as they're being utilized. I would encourage you to follow Medfield Outreach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we're on all three. While we are here for you, if there's ever a crisis or an emergency, I do wanna leave everybody with just two phone numbers or two ways to get immediate support because while we are, I feel, responsive to the community's needs, that may not be true if there's a crisis like on the weekend or in the middle of the night or something. So I just wanna point out to folks that Riverside Crisis, the phone number is 1-800-529 Five zero seven seven, and that is a twenty four seven. You get that is a local crisis resource, Riverside Crisis. The other is I wanted to give people if they prefer to text. There's a, um, a resource text. It's called Call to Talk, and what you would do is you would text this number seven four one seven four one, and you would put C two T, which is Call to Talk C two T to 741741, and that's 24 seven immediate help also. Someone will respond to that. So I just wanna make sure that someone has a resource no matter when they need it. Up next, we have a select board update with Chair Pete Peterson. We've been working on the uh, state hospital and the, with the, the development committee is working on their request for proposals that'll go out hopefully around March 1. And so that the uh, uh, select board now has their uh, second draft of that. The, the development committee created a first draft and uh, put it out for comments. They've gotten, a, they got a ton of comments actually. And, uh, and they've now put out a second iteration of the uh, request for proposals and the select board's gonna be reviewing that with the development committee tomorrow night. But, but we've been working with them right through February. Well, we've been working with them for a long time about that. Um, so that's the main thing um, that we've been working on. Uh, and then hopefully uh, tomorrow night the select board will will finally get a uh, an agreed document to go uh, to go forward with, and we'll find out whether any of the uh, development committees 
community is really interested in our property up there at the state hospital. I think what you find out with any, any real estate uh, project is that it's a long horizon. And if it's a municipal real estate project, it's an even longer horizon that you have to plan for. Um, our, our reuse committee took a, a, a long time, four or five years looking at, uh, at what we should do up there before they came up with a proposal for the town. Um, and now the question will be whether the marketplace really is interested in, in developing the, the site in accordance with that plan. Um, I had, uh, I started with very little hope that we would be able to uh, reuse any of the buildings up there. Uh, as I've learned more, I've, I've learned that uh, buildings in much further state of decay have actually been re rehabbed and redone. Um, what makes our proposal work financially, supposedly, is the historic tax credits and the low income tax credits, a combination of those two. So there's a lot of money that can get generated through those tax credits to make the, the, the uh, project actually financially feasible. I think the, for me, the important thing is that I want the state hospital to remain a site that is open and friendly to the residents. So I, I want the residents to feel some ownership of the, of the site the way they do now. Um, and that they can use it, that they don't feel excluded by the fact that there'll be people living there uh, and that it's, that it'll be a shared neighborhood uh, with the people that actually live there and all the people in town that want to keep using it for their own uh, walking or, or whatever purposes. It's a great gateway to uh, lots of, uh, of, of open space land along the Charles River. Uh, they're just beautiful trails along the river. We've got uh, an annual town meeting coming at the beginning of May, and uh, I think we've got about 50 uh, articles so that there's actually a lot of town business. I mean, part of that is that we didn't do um, anything but the budget at the uh, town meeting last year because of the, the virus, so that we've got a, a, a lot of things to do once we get to the uh, annual town meeting. Next, we have an update from the school committee. We wanted to uh, come and give an update regarding where we are as a district with our plans for full physical reentry, hopefully for all of our kids. Um, Does that mean from, full back, Jess? I mean, like, that's all like the kids full coming back. back. All, that is all the kids in, going to school every day of the week. Is that, yes. what, is that what you're saying? That is what I am saying. Do I? <laughs> hang on. Thank you. <laughs> we really wanted to talk about the specifics of information that we have, some of the challenges that we're going to face and where we want to go from here. We had very little basis to go off of on how to plan for something like this. We've been very consistent of keeping kids in mm -hmm. um, and keeping the, uh, the protocols in place, the safety protocols has resulted that we haven't had to uh, quarantine a school building or anything like that, um, which I think is huge. Thank you to the community for yeah. you know, practicing those protocols and to the schools and our teachers and our, and our students because uh, because they are following the rules and uh, doing such a good job of it, um, we can now right. we can now go back. So at this point, we have in school physically full time our pre K, which has been in since September, since we opened on September sixteenth. Our uh, kindergarten, which has been in since January fourth. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and we returned our first grades to school um, this Monday, so full-time since Monday. Um, and so Memorial itself is back. We are kind of doing a cascading plan of planning um, how we reconfigure space. We expect uh, Wheelock to be next and Dale uh, I do know that Dr. Morrison and the administrative team, being the principals and facilities managers um, spent and teachers, spent February vacation really looking at how do we put uh, kids not only the furthest distance away from each other that we can, but what sorts of ways can we kind of creatively create spaces so that they do not feel quite so um, odd, quite so disjointed. You know, we really are trying to look at consistency of education and curriculum 
as well as just how do we get the bodies there. The administration is absolutely looking at any, you know, any course section that might happen to be larger than others, um, they're going to move them into those larger spaces that are available, like, like CAFs or lecture halls and other things. We will be having a joint meeting with them on uh, March 9th yes. at 4 p.m. Uh, so that will be a joint meeting officially of the BOH and the school committee. And I see that, and I think uh, the chair of the BOH, Stephen Rush, see that as an opportunity for us to get together and talk about safety concerns, recommendations, because we will be bringing kids back in some grades um, at less than six feet. The federal government, the CDC, continues to recommend six feet unless it is not feasible to bring kids back at less than six feet, which is a little bit of a, a dance there. Um, but in a community in which our infection rates seem to be so low at this point, yeah, that um, is one of the we think I that's read. important. At the same time, our kids who are in high school are of the age that they are in a kind of slightly higher risk category than what we have been able to see over the last year in terms of spread with younger children. So we are being very mindful of that. You know, obviously that is a concern across the board. Um, so we do want to kind of get consultation and advice within that. The other thing we should probably mention here is around, um, you know, asking for some patience from everybody as we go back around bus route changes. I know, it's like, how do you ask for patience from Again. a community that has been so patient? <laughs> I know. So yeah. I'd like to reiterate that we're still going to maintain maintain safe distances on the bus. We're not sticking three kids in a no, seat. We're not sticking, yeah, exactly. I mean, if anything, I think that at this point we're expecting to... to it's one per seat, I believe. One per seat, which allows us to put... Mix it together, yeah. Right, which allows us to put 20... Instead of 23 kids on a bus, yeah, we, can, we put can put 46, 46. Yeah. which is uh, the, just the difference between just so few people having bus transport and being able to really financially make this work for us as well as just logistically. You know, there are not a lot of buses and there are not a lot of drivers out there. Dr. Marsden is going to be putting out a survey around um, parent and student uh, needs for uh, re-entry. We understand that there are some families who will not feel as though it is safe for them yet to return in anything outside of a hybrid model. And there is, a, um, there is an option to go to cohort D if you need to do that, but we really need to, you know, we hope that you've been thinking and marinating about that for the last, you know, 10 days or so, and that you can make that decision. We'll be talking about, you know, whether you need to take the bus um, and that Dr. Marsden is going to be putting that survey out in the next few days. Uh, so we're taping this today. It's the 27th. 7th, I think. 6th, <laughs> So please watch for it. Um, and this is one of those surveys where uh, it's not so much like kind of an opinion survey. It's really about like, we need to know, we need to know numbers so that we can be making this happen yes, as quickly as we can. We'll be monitoring the situation closely in the mm -hmm. schools, um, you know, about, you know, what the levels are. And right. I think that pool testing is big. So thank you for all the people who are consenting to do that. We always keep in mind uh, kids first. That is the committees, that is the administrations, and I believe that that is our teachers' best practices. And I, I have no reason to believe that that isn't oh, continuing to be the case. Absolutely. I'm hearing a lot of excitement from the yeah. teachers. Yeah, absolutely. They, they are, want, they, they want, they want, they want the same want things back. we do, yes. right? They just, yeah, they do. people yeah. just want to have they things just, be a little bit more normal or yeah. than they have been for a while. And it's not going to be normal. To stay up to date with all things Medfield, be sure to like Medfield TV on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Medfield TV. Watch full episodes of all of our shows on our website, medfield.tv slash watch or on our YouTube page, Medfield TV. Listen to meetings, interviews, and our original podcasts at medfield.tv slash listen, as well as on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Lastly, don't forget to tune into our cable stations, channels 8, 12, and 22 on Comcast, and channels 36, 45, and 47 on Verizon. That's it for the February 2021 episode. 
See you next month for another episode of Updates, your monthly Medfield updates. Thank you.